This is Stephen Palmer, and I am speaking today with Michael Lavery. Uh, today is September 5th, 2018, and we're conducting an interview for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Uh, Michael, do you like to be called Michael or Mike? Would you, what do you prefer? I generally prefer Mike. Okay, I'll call you Mike. Um, if you take about 10 minutes or so and give us background, year you were born, family, where, religion, friends, Give us a sense of where you're from. I was born June 30th, 1942, in a small town in northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, about 30 miles south of Erie, 90 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's a solidly middle class. I grew up in the town's only suburbs. It was essentially pre-configured ranch-style houses. Uh, built in the early 50s. I lived there from 52 until I left home. Uh, my parents, my father was in the steel fabrication. He was uh, in sales. My mother, who is uh, an immigrant from Scotland, emigrated here in 1923 or so when she was six years old. Um, the only strange thing or different thing for my parents uh, my father was a Democrat in the heavily Republican region, so maybe that counts for some of my uh, um, being out of the ordinary. Uh, Franklin and most of my community was a Roman Catholic uh, town. I went to a Roman Catholic uh, grade school, first through eighth grade, and then to high school. High school, I served as a editor of the newspaper, junior and senior play, uh, as opposed to most of my friends, uh, went to what were then called teachers' colleges, essentially community colleges, or to Penn State. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, ultimately, I wanted, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, never got that. Couldn't do well, and particularly in science. But I went to Pittsburgh because it was trying a new type of educational system called the trimester system, in which you could graduate not in four years, but two and two thirds years. Uh, that is, they had three trimesters per year. Uh, so I finished college in three years. Um, during that time, prior to some time during that probably 60, 61, uh, I became involved with the anti-war movement. Uh, Let's back up a little bit then. Okay. Um, and then we'll bring it right to the right. anti-war movement. Um, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have a sister who is uh, eight years younger than I am. Okay. Um, and were you a practicing Catholic yourself? I would say n yes and no. That is, most of the rituals were performed. We went to church every Sunday. I wasn't particularly a believer, at least from the time of 13 on. 13 and from the time uh, in which uh, puberty began. <laughs> so I had no particular use for that nonsense. Well, let's talk about puberty then. Um, and if you could discuss um, when you started noticing same-sex attractions, attractions to other boys. Uh, probably around 12 or 13. But I was also uh, very bookish. So that, uh, the reason I put those together is because uh, I, you know, my local library spent a lot of time and, you know, one of the things I did was read things like the child from um, 12 to 13 or 13 to whatever, and it very much said, you know, things like uh, same-sex masturbation, none of that was uh, particularly uh, harmful or read a lot. So at least I uh, never had any particular kept it to myself, but never had any particular uh, regrets or sorrows or any of those. Uh, you know, 
going, I wasn't going to burn in hell, and I wasn't going to, you know, be uh, forever damned. Very lucky. So the whole idea of the masturbation as a cardinal sin in the Catholic Church did not affect you? No, not at all. And you said that the... And homosexuality, the idea didn't affect me. Um, I knew it was a taboo subject, but beyond that, no shame, guilt, wish I were not different. Did your parents or sister or any family members or friends recognize anything different about you? Not at that time. And how about any experiences with boys, any sexual experiences in the just, teenage years? Just f we got fooling around. I was a Boy Scout, a Boy Scout leader, ultimately an Eagle Scout. Uh, but yeah, circle jerks, those, those types of things. I like the uniform. <laughs> um, you, you went to college graduated um, in early 60s? I graduated undergraduate in 1963. 1963. What was your major in college? Uh, ultimately philosophy. Philosophy. And did you have other friends in college who were gay, who you recognized? or? Well, that's when I had my first experiences was in college. Are you comfortable talking about that? Sure, briefly. Uh, that would make it 1961. Uh, for some reason, one of my fraternity brothers decided I was gay and decided to hook me up with someone. Um, it turned out to be disastrous, but nevertheless, uh, uh, a week or so later, uh, one of my fraternity brothers uh, propositioned me and we slept together. Again, I was, was not particularly uh, satisfactory. But, uh, I mean, I certainly knew what I wanted and certainly knew what was happening, uh, though I didn't know particularly the mechanics. Uh, and about that time, again, I'm very bookish. I went and read a book. What else would you do? You know, it's Donald Webster's Corey, it's The Homosexual in America. What was the author's name? Donald Webster Corey, The Homosexual in America, Edward Sagarin. Uh, and from that, um, I learned that there were these organizations. There was the Wadden Society and the Mattachine Society. And I wrote them a letter uh, asking about membership which ultimately they respond. I think um, even Mattachine, I wrote to something, Mattachine Society, San Francisco, because they didn't have an address. Ultimately, I joined uh, by mail Mattachine, lying about my age, because you were supposed to be 21 and I was 20, so that would make it 1962. Could you talk a little bit about one the One Organization? One was an organization founded in shortly after World War II. Uh, I had a variety of uh, famous people who founded it. Uh, and it lasted until mid-70s. So it was one of two gay national organizations. The other being the Mattachine Society. What were some of those famous names that were part of the one organization? Because I'll mispronounce his name, so whatever. Rudy Genrich or so, who was a fashion designer, a couple of Hollywood people. It's a, I wasn't because of them. I had no idea who they were at the time. And it was in the uh, in that book that you were reading where you found out the names of these organizations. Or the organizations. And what what did it say about what did you know about the Mattachine Society at that point, early sixties? 
other than I was essentially a gay civil rights organization, homosexual civil rights organization. Let's go back to where we had left it before about your political consciousness in the early 60s as well. Um, the anti-war movement, which would have been, I guess, very early anti-war. Um, well, it was, uh, prior to that, it was anti-nuclear disarmament. So I was be, uh, belonged to uh, Pittsburgh's SPU, Student Peace Union, on uh, their first went on their first big demonstration, November 61, I believe, which they demonstrated in front of the White House, was it turned towards peace. Um, I recently mentioned on a Facebook po post, at that time I briefly met Dave McReynolds, who died, uh, this is uh, September of 2018. He died uh, a few weeks ago. And he was uh, one of the organizers for TTP. As a, he saw, was also a gay man, but, which I did not know at the time. Oh, OK. Um, what was it like for you to be at a demonstration in front of the White House at that time? That's, that's kind of ballsy stuff. You're Boring. I, I always I find demonstrations to be totally boring. Uh, one of my posts on Facebook shows someone carrying a sign, uh, you know, in terms of you know, something about ending all signs. Or, or I used to joke that you know we're on a journey, the ideal thing, a journey to the end of meetings. I find most demonstrations absolutely, utterly boring. I'm there because I think I should be. I'm there to provide a warm body. Uh, I get n I'm not enthusiastic about chanting and, and certainly not enthusiastic about walking around in a circle. Um, understood. Similar feeling. Um, after college, what happens next? Work. I go to law school. So I spent 63 through 66 in law school at the University of Pittsburgh. And at, were you, when you were in law school, were you also part of Mattachine? Uh, all, uh, all of it was by mail. And I had very little actual experiences, though I had a couple in, in law school. I had an encounter with the FBI. I had uh, joined a mailing list of some sort, 1963. Uh, came back to the dorms. There were two men in, I want to say brown shoes, but I'm not sure they were, but they looked the parts. They wanted to talk to me about this mailing list. Uh, and did, uh, amongst other things, they said, gee, you know, did the law school or the university know that I was, you know, receiving these types of things or on this mailing list? Well, as far as I know, they don't. Uh, well, and you were receiving this magazine from, I said, you know, from one, which has gone to the Supreme Court and which was deemed not pornographic or mailable item. Well, well, uh, well. Uh, yeah, I have nothing more to say, and they left. Well, of course, I was shaky in my, my boots, but nevertheless, um, I had just that morning finished a, a discussion on censorship in a constitutional law class. You kept your cool through that. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, people tell me that. I may be shaking inside, but. Um, also, as I continue to be somewhat active in the anti-peace, the anti-war movement, uh, by that time I had uh, registered as a conscientious objector, 
which had been denied and was working its way through the system. Ultimately, it went all the way to a presidential appeal, denying all the way. Um, understand this was the beginnings of the Vietnam War. Uh, I continued to be, I was, the University of Pittsburgh established a separate student peace union. I was uh, nominally the vice president uh, one day we gave the meeting over to some people who wanted to promote their organization, which got us in trouble with the university. Um, it was an organization that had recently formed in Michigan. Uh, it was an outgrowth of the Student League for Industrial Democracy uh, called the Students for a Democratic Society. And ultimately the university called me on the carpet um, wanting to know a number of things. Why we had given you know, meaning space to this subversive group and also why I in particular had been, I had been noticed on a TV report that showed a young man who was uh, on trial in the federal court for bringing his draft card and I was shown to be um, in a group talking to him. Again, I was somewhat defiant. Uh, don't know really much more to say about, about that. But When you went for conscientious objector status, did you have to explain your personal reason for being against the war? Yes. I essentially took a philosophical view, though um, I knew from, again, experience uh, that uh, if it were religiously based it probably had a better chance. So I was uh, a member of all these alphabet organizations, uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, FOR, War Sisters League, WRL, the Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors, and uh, uh, the Catholic, something, Catholic Council of Conscientious at least to get enough information to know that uh, they couldn't say, oh, you have to be a member of a traditional peace church. So what ended up happening? It was denied from the local board all the way through. Um, I think the last denial was something like 68. So it took five years or four years to work its way through the system. During that period, at the end of that period, I was also granted a security clearance. How come? I worked, one of my job, first jobs after law school was working for the university and the university company that was the first to do, use computers to research the law. And one of their contracts was to uh, put treaties of the United States essentially uh, making them computer searchable and that required um, a clearance from the Air Force. It was a contract with the Air Force. And But you have to understand treaties include such things as if uh, an Air Force base in Germany wanted to expand their sewer system since it's a, and had to contract with someone, since it's a contract between an entity of the United States and a German entity, it's considered to be a treaty. But, and these things were in an office in the Pentagon. Uh, frequently, the only copies they have were like the third, co third carbon copy of a memo of something. And my job, part of it, for a while, was essentially an old fax Xerox machine going through a file and copying, <laughs> making these copies so that they could be transported back to Pittsburgh to be ta punched onto Hollow Earth cards, or what used to be called key punch cards. So you didn't have to serve. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, 
1967 or so. I received my draft notice, has had a pre primary, a preliminary physical before that, and received a draft notice and another physical during the midst of the physical. I checked the box, uh, it said homosexual. I was supposed to leave on the bus that night. Uh, they said, they uh, got, oh, well, uh, they really didn't know what to do. Uh, should come back tomorrow for an interview. Uh, I interviewed with uh, some psychologist or psychiatrist who kept asking me questions of what it was like to be a homosexual uh, and what, what was my first homosexual experience. And I sort of described it in a clini clinical term and he seemed to be unimpressed. I said, I got fucked. <laughs> oh, well, that, that's enough. Uh, he wasn't taking the nice and clinical, so decided I would be graphic. And it was, uh, I then received a 1F. Were you worried that getting a 1F would um, ruin your career? No, I was more worried that they weren't going to give anything and uh, there I was going to have to stand and say, you know, I, I refuse and not get on the bus and not step forward to take the oath. And I really didn't want to go to jail. I, whether or not I ultimately would have, I don't know. But I convinced myself at least I was prepared to do it. <laughs> when you checked the box, did you feel sure of yourself doing that or was there a worry about it? Well, there was a worry because again, it was possibly stigma, whatever, but I wasn't gonna go. <laughs> Hell no, I won't go. And it clearly wasn't enough for people to just be involved in the anti-war movement. People had been involved in the anti-war movement and then drafted and went to Vietnam. That's right. Um, so in the late 60s, you're involved in the peace movement. Um, when, what kind of involvement with gay, other gay people, gay bars? Uh, I, I know you were uh, correspondence with- 66. Them. At a student peace union meeting, I met a freshman who was extremely aggressive. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. Uh, we uh, ultimately became boyfriends, lasted about five years. Uh, so uh, the rest of the time that when I was in Pittsburgh, So he graduated in three years, so, and in 68 we broke up. He moved to New York. I followed about three months later, uh, arriving in New York uh, the night of the Democratic Convention in Chicago, August 1968. Uh, during the time in Pittsburgh, I continued in terms of receiving information from Mattachine, one, other organizations, the Janus Society in Philadelphia. Somewhere around 1967, uh, we, tr we brought uh, someone from Columbia, which had recently started the uh, Student Homophile Union, uh, and I forget which one, you know, Steve Donaldson, or all of them had names to Pittsburgh to try to uh, start a uh, chapter of uh, in Pittsburgh, it was a resounding failure. <laughs> I think one graduate student from somewhere uh, showed up, but nevertheless, we at least tried. In <laughs> uh, Pittsburgh, uh, after you know '66, uh, after having a boyfriend. At various times, splitting up, not splitting up. 
I certainly became involved with the gay, gay, gay life in Pittsburgh. Uh, not much doing in the university, but uh, uh, Pittsburgh had a vibrant, um, active gay life in the late 60s. It had a social club called the Transportation Club, uh, which was a private club which had dancing, and alcohol. And there were half dozen or so gay bars at various times being raided, closed. Were you ever in a gay bar that was raided? No. If you were to describe um, what gay life was like at that time, um, how people socialized, what what the level of consciousness was, what the conversations about, if there were any, about gay rights. I mean, there's Mattachine, there's... Yeah. Well, I'm not one that looks back upon that period as, oh, such a dreadful time. It was a time in which people were guarded. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they broadcast that they were gay, but in the uh, 60 through 68, I get, knew a good number of people that were gay. Uh, in my opinion, probably if anyone looked, they certainly would uh, arrive at that conclusion. Uh, I was part of a university community. That certainly was one aspect that made it different. I lived in the artistic area of the city, Shady Side, which is um, where things were beginning to happen artistically, musically, whatever. Uh, most of the people I knew were involved with the university, academics, or so. It's a, certainly, in some ways, you could say it was a, um, a sheltered life, or at least somewhat sheltered. Or they call now a safe space. Right, I would say so. Was there any conversation at that time in Pittsburgh that Warhol had been from Pittsburgh and? Yes, um, went to a showing of there were a couple of Warhol films at a, I think it was a church social center. Um, and there were concern, at least uh, indications that the police were might raid it, since I think one of the films that they were going to show was Blowjob. Was that with Joe D'Alessandro? Um, I don't, no, I don't think so. No. Blowjob is essentially a two-hour film or something, someone getting a blowjob. That's a long blowjob. Well, it's most of it, a lot of it's sleeping. But it's like Empire State is, you know, three hours of the Empire State Building. So these were the earlier, his might not experimental films, not even those with a particular subject. But yes, I certainly in by 68 was aware of Warhol. What kind of music were you listening to? See, that's before pre-disco. I have no idea. I mean, I, I guess it's early rock. Um, because I was, uh, I was not particularly part of the music scene. During law school, I worked very hard. Uh, I was certainly a drudge but because I, in some ways, some subjects I hadn't done well as an undergraduate. Uh, I didn't want to fail out of law school. Again, that would have conf been a confrontation. Uh, you know, probably would have gotten drafted immediately. Confrontation with my parents. It would also mean not a success, a failure. So I worked very hard during law school and therefore most popular media I sort of wasn't aware of. I mean, I wasn't particularly aware in a contracts class 
uh, on a Monday, people came in and were talking about you know, this thing they saw on TV on Ed Sullivan. Was these four guys from England or something, they were called the Beatles. And I'd never, never heard of them. So, uh, I mean, I can't really, I uh, you know, guess, don't know whether that's before Janis Joplin or. She comes onto the scene, she becomes really, she hit San Francisco in 66, but she gets, becomes popular with the Monterey Pop Festival film where she's singing. So I'm very songs. bad in terms of, you know, rock groups, um, you know, things like Chicago and all that was only afterwards. Uh, what was your what was your sense of the counterculture, the hippie counterculture in the late sixties? Uh, it was romantic. It was a romantic idea. Uh, I could not see me doing it. I could not see just deciding to uh, you know, just let it let it go. It would, someone would have to support me. I wasn't going to have my parents support me. Um, I wasn't just going to go there. Um, I mean, I had gone to a lecture by Timothy Leary. Um, really? Certain, certain, at uh, Duquesne University of Pittsburgh. Um, I certainly, uh, friends smoked pot. I wasn't big into grass. Uh, during that period of time, one of my, my, my boyfriend's roommate, we weren't living together at the time, made the whole big deal in terms of smoking pot. Put on his caftan, light the incense, and take out his little box that was, you know, tooled and, you know, all of that. <laughs> uh, during that period, I almost never smoked, smoked very little pot. If we were going to a party or so, I was the one usually driving. Pittsburgh is spread out, need, to, need a car like New York. I was driving, I wasn't going to. Um, I'm just the type that if I were, had four other people in the car, I'm not gonna be stoned or so. Only stoned and enjoyed it once I came to New York, when you could walk or take a subway or um, so it was certain the counterculture was there. Um, one of my, someone that I was very enamored with, ultimately left Pittsburgh to go to San Francisco. Um, as I indicated in our brief conversation at that time, he was someone who went from flowers in his hair to a needle in his arm. It was just, you know. And that was sort of, you know, so, so I never really became, you know, in terms of part of joyous expression. It was there, but it was always a little too romantic. Did your uh, seeing Timothy Leary make you want to try LSD at all? Uh, not particularly, and I never have. Um, I, I, the reason is not you know, negative, but I never, never could find the time in which I could give wanted eight hours for a, with nothing, nothing to do. Uh, I had uh, thought I would do so on Fire Island, I, um, but you know, I felt you had to really trust someone. Uh, uh, too many uh, friends of you know tripping all over the place, and, you know, whether walking in front of a car or out in the ocean. Or, you know, uh, but I never got around to it. Let me ask you one more question before we head into 1969. Right. We will get there, I promise. But I want to get the whole ambiance. Um, your parents. When do your parents? When do you speak to them about being gay? When do you come out to them? Probably somewhere around uh, late 70s. Oh, late 70s. Okay. All right. 
Um, and, and in the meantime, you haven't had girlfriends or? No. And your parents have Never had a, you know, Parents never had Other a, than a you know, date to the prom. Never had a, a girlfriend. And they didn't ask. And they didn't ask. And they never asked, you know, gee, why are you know, everyone else getting drafted? Why aren't you being drafted? They must have been happy you weren't drafted. Well, uh, yes, they were. They probably were. Uh, but I find it always curious that they never, never brought up the subject. <laughs> They knew that I had uh, registered as a conscientious objector, that I had told them uh, 62, as soon as I did it. And I know their reaction was the first thing they went to the parish priest to, to, to find out, you know, was this all right? I, uh, uh, but we never really had a discussion about it. What did the parish priest say? I have no idea, but I assume he said, well, you know, it can be done, but it's generally not. <laughs> um, so 1969 rolls along. Uh, you're now in New York? I am in New York. Where are you living? I am living at uh, Beginning in 69, I am living at 500 and a half East 84th Street with, with a boyfriend, same boyfriend from Pittsburgh. What was New York City like at that time when you came here? What were your impressions? Exciting. Um, I can't say particularly more than that. I mean, we were struggling. Uh, I certainly was struggling. Uh, though I had been making more money than I ever made in my life. I had gotten a new job. Um, I was working part-time for uh, Time, uh, uh, Times Mirror Corporation, which owned the LA Times, and part-time for Matthew Bender that was a legal publisher. I was a technological consultant to the president on the use of computers and the law. I was making at that time a, uh, a tremendous $11,000 a year. Uh, I tell people, you know, my first job, I made minimum wage, which was 50 cents an hour. People just can't even imagine making 50 cents an hour, and I was ecstatic when I got promoted to a, a desk job at the student union behind the desk at 75 cents an hour. And I worked part-time, 20 hours a week for 75 cents an hour. When, when so, yeah, I was in New York, we were living on the Upper East Side, uh, struggling, sort of fighting, not fighting. Uh, we had a good number of friends. We went out regularly to um, you know, some bar. There was a bar on East 72nd Street, weekends or so. Um, what was the name of the bar? Don't know. Don't remember. Don't remember at all. Did you go into Central Park at all near the Rambles? Did you ever notice any of the activity there? I so, was certainly aware of the Rambles. Uh, didn't go into the rambles until after we had broken up. Um, but I have had experiences, in, did have experiences in the rambles. What was the rambles like at that time? Uh, well, since I always work, had to go to work in the morning, I was probably there rather early. Uh, if you, depending upon the day and the time of year, there was always, um, half dozen or so guys in various ways uh, rambling through <laughs> the rambles. Uh, more active was Central Park West. Uh, the benches along uh, Central Park West, because the park is officially closed at night. Uh, 
Central Park West was more in the, the cruising area, like Christopher Street was in the village. Which part of Central Park West was this? Roughly at the entrance of the Rambles, 72nd Street uh, on the west side. I don't know whether there are benches there now or not. There's a stone wall that separates the park from the sidewalk, and there were benches all along, a few street lights, and sometimes the street lights were out, and it was the whole ritual. Got a light, lived near here, uh, got the time. <laughs> you know, so good response to got a light was like, you know, 8.30. No longer particularly the intellectual that it was, but it was still political, active. Not the East Village, which was more hippie, uh, more flower child. Um, I would say in 69, the village, I couldn't describe it as a particular character yet. I mean, the East Village later involved, at least in my mind, to be streets filled with uh, uh, speed addicts and junkies. Um, like Hate Street had become after right. the summer of love. West Village, less so, or certainly not as much. Uh, 69 things were still just beginning to evolve. I mean, the stone wall was there. Uh, there were a number of gay bars. I, my first attempt to go to a gay bar was 64. Came to New York, stayed overnight at the William Sloan House, the, the YMCA. I certainly knew what was going on um, in terms of guys who would stand in the shower for two hours or walk down the hall, people with their doors open, but I was uh, not particularly too shy to engage. But I came to New York, uh, 64, for the World's Fair. I went to the village, learned how to use the subway, went to the west, uh, to um, the area around NYU, McDougal Street. So um, again, had no idea particularly where to go. Um, I, I stood at the corner outside of some bar, disco. Uh, someone came up to me who I identified as a hustler, and he seemed to think that that's what I was there for. And he said, gee, you know, very slow you know, tonight. Maybe I'll go over to the gay part. And he left, and I tried to follow him, and I lost him. He went down. A street I'd never been on, it was Greenwich Avenue. But I'd never been on it, and I was disappointed. Most of the gay bars had been closed in 64 because uh, they were raided prior to the World's Fair. Um, it was uh, um, Mayor Wagner. Wagner, Wagner, right? Wagner. To clean up New York City before oh. the World's Fair. Uh, the next time I came to New York was around um, 67. Came, 67, I came to New York. Um, I had 66, 66 I spent uh, New Year's, Christmas, the Christmas vacation in New York. Some friends from Pittsburgh and we took me to a bar called Julius's and a couple of other places. It's not the first gay bar. I've been in a couple of gay bars prior to that on other visits to New York. But this was you know, the main thing for, for Julius's. Um, I, when I came to New York on business a couple of times, I only knew how to get to Julius's from a midtown hotel. I went to Ju I went to Julius's one time 
in 66, six, early 68. Yes, early 68. Um, and there was no one there. It was almost entirely empty. Uh, I knew it was early in the evening. It must have been about 7 o'clock. But then I heard some people saying, gee, you know, there's no one here. Everybody must be at the new place. New place on Christopher. And they, they left. And I, again, I wasn't quick enough to follow them. I, you know, and I was too shy to ask anyone. So I went, going back to the hotel, I stopped at the corner of 6th Avenue, where uh, the crossroads, the old Barnes & Noble is now. There used to be a, a new news, newsstand there that had maps. And I went in, got a Sarah looked at a map, to find out where this Christopher Street was. Of course, it was just around the corner. I found it and I walk, was walking down the street and I saw all these guys going into this sort of burnout, looked at sort of burnout building. Big sign that said Stonewall. And walked in and since I had been to clubs before in Pittsburgh, there was a guy who asked, are you a member? And everyone seemed to be saying yes. And he never checked anything. You say yes, and he'd say sign in. I signed in, went inside, um, heard music, but couldn't see any. Lean up against the wall, I almost got knocked over because the wall opened. The stone wall at that time had a area for a bar and then another area for dancing, but it had a sort of partition that closed. I went inside, um, I had gotten a beer, went inside, was there about 10 minutes. Some guy comes up to me and he says, I want to suck your cock. And I said, why not? <laughs> and off we went. It turned out it was uh, a place just up the street from where I now live. But I and I had been in Stonewall a couple of times afterwards, but it was not my, uh, it was not particularly a bar that I frequented after I came to New York. And my boyfriend and I usually went to a bar, uh, as I said, on 72nd Street. Closer to home. Right. In your description before of the uh, YMCA, it sounds like the YMCA was like the original bathhouse, almost. Well, the, all the YMCAs. The William Sloan House was an enormous, uh, resi both residential and transient facility. YMCA at that time had housing, uh, all of which were notoriously in New York gay. Uh, one on 72nd Street, around 72nd Street, one on the east side around 43rd Street, all of which uh, for the late 60s, early 70s, uh, were, you, know, you could rent rooms by the, the night, the week, the month. The William Sloan House had hundreds of cubicle spaces, rooms, all of which uh, you know, were, were transient facilities transient facilities. Yeah. They deserve their own chapter. It's interesting how many times that get, it gets brought up with people coming to New York to visit or just moving here and it being a way station to before they, you know, get an apartment. Well, uh, a night at, during that period when I stayed there twice, uh, the, a night was uh, something like $4. Again, this is the era which, which I was making 75 cents an hour. <laughs> um, can you talk about the first time you heard about the uh, uprising at Stonewall? Uh, uh, okay. I had worked, I was working for a publisher. You got, have to get a sort of a round to it. Working for a publisher, uh, Times Mirror, which uh, Matthew Bender, which was owned the LA Times. Uh, they had scheduled me in the end of July, 
end of June, 69, in L.A. My boss had said to me, gee, uh, you, know, you haven't had a vacation. Why don't you go to the meeting? And they had a, we had an office in San Francisco. Uh, you can visit the office in San Francisco. It's a great drive, you know, driving from L.A. to San Francisco up the coast. If you do that, you know, uh, you can charge it as a business expense. And, you know, I'll pay for it. Uh, and you can take the days as, you know, vacation days. So I had decided, uh, to, I invited my boyfriend to come with me. Uh, we had had a big argument. He had wanted to go to Europe. All we could afford to go to was Iceland. And I certainly, I said, I certainly wasn't going to go to Iceland. I can't see any re reason to go to Iceland. I had said, come to California, we'll pay half I'll pay half the, you know, my fare's covered. I'll pay, you know, half of your fare. So we went, we did the whole California bit, Mexico, Los Angeles, Disneyland, and drove up the coast. It was just before the 4th of July. The friends we were visiting, one worked for KPFA, Pacifica Radio. We had gone to Berkeley the Berkeley uh, to uh, be part of a protest at the People's Park in Berkeley. Uh, it was July 3rd. They were closing down the People's Park. They brought out the fire hoses. I ducked into a bookstore to, get, to escape the fire hoses uh, and bought a copy of the Berkeley Barb, which said, Faggots Riot, riot in New York. They had rioted. Uh, Stonewall had been a couple of days before. Uh, on returning to New York, uh, we read The Voice, a variety of things, went to a demonstration in front of the Women's House of Detention the week following Stonewall. So that I was not a Stonewall, uh, but did discover a Stonewall uh, in the midst of uh, a different type of riot. <laughs> So you were at the, the protest for People's Park in Berkeley? Right. Wow. And so the, was the National Guard there yet? Don't they, remember. Um, what was I mean, there are, uh, you know, I'm 76. There are certainly portions of that, you know, we stayed with friends. I have no recollection as I knew, we knew them from Pittsburgh, but I have no recollection of how I got to know them or how, you know, at least well enough that they gave us a place to stay overnight. So there are gaps, but. Uh, but you knew about the people, people park, people's park struggle though. Yes, that's why I was there, I, you know. I was not entirely, uh, So, with the riot that happened there, you end up in one of the bookstores, maybe Moe's or Cody's or one of those bookstores, and it's the Berk. Do you have that Berkeley bar, bar from that time? No, I don't. I just have to note that I want to look that up. Berkeley bar, July. I'm sure it was the. It had to be the Berkeley bar. The, the faggots riot. Right. I have old Berkeley barbs. I do not have that. Interesting. So it would have been somewhere between the date of Stonewall, which I guess is the 23rd, or somewhere between the 23rd and the 28th, or something around. Um, 23rd and the 3rd of July. The uh, Stonewall is late June, further right. Right. So, okay. Um, so you come back to uh, New York. What was your thought when you saw this? Uh, well, certainly interesting. As I said, I was a member of a variety of gay organizations. Uh, in New York, I had gone, tried out the West Side Discussion Group. I thought they were rather boring. They were at a place called the Corduroy Club that was in the mid-30s or so. It, it 
they seem to be a group of somewhat boring older men. Uh, and I wasn't particularly interested. The Mattachine Society, I wasn't really aware of in New York. By that time, the Mattachine <clears throat> had become rather staid. Uh, the, other, the other organizations were in Philadelphia, so that I was at least aware of things going on, but not an active participant. So when, this seemed like to be some activity. We went to the we went to the demonstration. I remember there was a march from the women's house of detention through the village. Some guy was handing out leaflets, probably Marty Robinson. It was announcing a meeting of something called the Mattachine Action Group. Since I Mattachine was a brand name that I was familiar with, uh, Rob and I went to the meeting on the Upper West Side. Middle West Side, something, 70s or so, the Mattachine Action Group. Uh, that, Matt, that group composed a variety of people. Joe Miles, Marty Robinson, Jerry Hughes, Bob Kohler, Marty Nixon, must have been a couple of others. Um, well, he, w he was the director of the Mattachine, but not part of the Mattachine Action Group or the equivalent of that. You were talking about the Mattachine Action Group. The Mattachine Action Group was, uh, existed for a short while. It was the attempt of a number of activists to make Mattachine relevant or at least to uh, do something other than the other group that was emerging called Gay Liberation Front. Uh, Managing Action Group existed from roughly July through the end of August, so whole two months. Uh, I had been a, a GLF was already beginning then. Um, they seemed, um, I don't know, a little too angry <laughs> for me at the, during that period of time. We're talking about a whole two months uh, again. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Mattachine brand recognition, name that I knew, uh, having been a member of Mattachine, uh, so I went to the, the Mattachine group. Uh, we tried to do a number of things, only did one thing, I think, really. Uh, my boyfriend, uh, proposed an idea that we do a march in celebration. Uh, uh, the German Federal Republic had just repealed Article 175, which was the Nazi-era anti-homosexual -homo law. Uh, we had a brief parade or brief march in front of the German embassy, essentially trying to draw uh, attention that Germany had repealed it, why shouldn't the United States? And I think it was the same weekend in which there was uh, a big thing in Queens where someone had destroyed a number of trees and uh, wrote anti-gay things. Uh, that was about the only, it was somewhere uh, Labor Day. Uh, the two of us went to one of the dances that GLF had uh, started. And I was very impressed. They, uh, it was big, and there were hundreds of people there. And I thought, gee, you know, this is something. Something's happening here. Uh, Where was the location of this? Alternate U, 14th Street and 6th Avenue. Uh, that something was happening, and we had been getting some negative generally negative feedback from uh, the Mattachine Society. They thought, you know, these people, they wanted to bring these young kids under control, and they were being a little too radical and a little too pushy and a little too, little too everything. 
so that it seemed that Manachine was not going to go anywhere with this, whatever this thing that was happening, uh, this gay liberation, uh, the outgrowth of the riots uh, a month before. So I, uh, the two of us went to, uh, after the dance, to the Sunday night meeting of GLF, which was at the church on West 4th. I believe West 4th. Forget which church it was. And we continued to go to Sunday night, the Sunday night meetings uh, of GLF taking place in a variety of demonstrations. Um, I was active with all sorts of demonstrations for GLF. Uh, particularly those that happened at night or on weekends because I worked a nine to five job as opposed to most of the people I knew who were involved in things. Uh, I was still working nine to five uh, in order to uh, make money to pay the rent, to do all those types of things that prevented me from putting flowers in my hair and going to San Francisco. Uh, Somewhere, roughly, we went to a, a demonstration, and a number of us, the former members of the Mattachine Action Group, went to an anti-war demonstration in Washington, uh, roughly October 69. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, most of the people that I went with invited the um, Jim Miles invited me to a meeting at his apartment. They had become dissatisfied with GLF, and uh, they were having a meeting to what he described was explore other options. That meeting, they decided to form a new group. Um, I had decided, no, I didn't want to go to that meeting. Uh, I felt I had some loyalty to GLF, and I thought they were being overblown in terms of their uh, objections to GLF. What were their objections? Well, that they were involved with other issues other than gay rights. And they were involved with things like the Panthers, and Young Lords, and um, they were being a little radical, political, and uh, that there should be an organization or a group that was concerned with gay people and gay people alone. That group ultimately became that meeting that I didn't go to was the organizational meeting for GAA. And GAA stands for? Gay Activist Alliance. You know, it was formed by Marty Robinson and Jim Miles, Arthur Bell, Arthur Evans, uh, I think there are something like 12 people officially listed on their organizational founders. What was your feeling about the Gay Liberation Front and, and the direction it was taking, this sort of multi-issued tactic? I thought it was getting somewhat off base. That it, I, I liked the idea that in order to get support, to support for one group, you perhaps had to support them. You want you know, something like Black Panthers or Young Lords to support you, you had to provide some support to them. The question was how much support, what kinds of support, if it meant looking upon, you know, us as sort of these white, rich guys, which certainly for the most part GLF was white, though not particularly rich and not particularly affluent in any ways, uh, but inter as a, a banker, something I wasn't in favor of. But I didn't, didn't see that as that was what was happening. Grand, there was some white guilt, there was a variety, all of which were 
sort of mixed in, but, and they, things like the Black Panthers or Young Lords, which is the, some would say the Puerto Rican equivalent of the Black Panthers. Where you know, I use a slogan, you know, one struggle, one fight. Uh, we were sort of in this together. Uh, again, with my not particularly radical background, but this wasn't particularly new. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, people wanted to do, GLF was the type of org, the whole idea was, do whatever you want in GLF. If you want to do something, you organize a cell. If you want to do everyone doing their thing. So if there are groups that want to be heavily into, you know, working with the Black Panthers, it's fine with me. I didn't care. I wasn't necessarily one of them, but uh, ultimately I became a member of a cell called the Aquarius Cell, which was responsible for uh, putting on the dances. Put, uh, dances were a fundraising mechanism, they were a social mechanism. We were responsible for you know, uh, taking some money at the door, other people were responsible for buying the supply, all of that. Uh, my time with GLF was spent going to demonstrations by, um, the, let's see, that was 69 through uh, 70, June of 70, when I was involved with GLF. Um, left GLF in the week before the first March, June 1960, uh, 1970. Uh, that's when the Aquarius cell essentially uh, left GLF. Uh, there was an attempt of you know, we were doing all the, from our perspective, we were doing all the work for the, uh, put on the dances, this and that, and there was a group, women, who decided that they needed the money that was being raised for the dances and that uh, GLF should give them the money for their uh, offshoot organization. Aquarius disagreed. <laughs> uh, and it also included that Aquarius would continue to work and the money would continue to go to a group other than GLF. It caused a split. I walked out of the meeting, never went back. The split was caused by the money being funneled to I think, I'm not sure which group it was. It might have been Lesbian Liberation. GLF had a number of takeovers in various ways. Uh, GLF had a newspaper called Come Out, and the people who were in charge of Come, which were fi funded by the dances, a variety of other, the GLF's primary source of income. The Come Out Collective decided that since they were doing all the work, that the newspaper was theirs, and they were going to own Come Out, which entering into a commercial distributor to distribute Come Out on the newsstands, and they were going to take the supplies, everything that had been bought by the general organization, and any money coming in, so that was the first split off. Then there had been money given to the Black Panthers to help them, and then the whole thing with the Aquarius cell is that they decided, to, from my perspective, <laughs> that there were people doing the work, but nevertheless, that they did not benefit from the money. We weren't trying to take the money, we wanted it to be used, the Aquarius cell, to be used for the rest of GLF. Uh, GLF decided to give it to the this Emerging Women's Organization. And the Emerging Women's Organization was not one of the cells? Right. It was going to be separate, apart 
distinct, different. <laughs> and that was because there was a whole meaning in uh, dealing with the oppression of men, and you know, gay men were um, denigrating women because they were ignoring them, including ignoring them sexually. And I found that to be an argument of extremely absurd, that it was discrimination that because gay men weren't inter interested sexually in women, that it was discrimination against women. So that argument could be turned around the other way. Well, no. well all, all, only if you're not a discriminated group. Gotcha. Okay. Women were the discriminated group, Understood. not men. Understood. So, at least to buy my feeling it was men could do no right. This was getting ridiculous, you know, uh, to, to argue that I was discriminating against women because I was only interested in having sex with men. And I walked out. <laughs> and where did you walk to when you walked out? Where did you, what? Didn't. Uh, spent six months or so in terms of uh, still independently going to demonstrations. I still knew all the, all the people that I had met there. Uh, I decided somewhere in November and December I would look into this GAA group uh, and was surprised that I went. There must have been 150 or so people on this, this meeting and it was in a church and it seemed to be well organized and they had announced that they had just rented a firehouse and uh, there were all these committees that seemed to be you know doing stuff and doing stuff uh, with enthusiasm and with some not haphazard and not Again, you know, I decided, well, gee, I mean, this is a group I should you know, get involved with. So then I joined GAA. Let's back up a little bit, and then we'll get back to GAA. Talk about the first march, June 1970. What it was like, who you marched with. I marched with a couple of friends. Uh, since I wasn't no longer part of GLF and not yet part of GAA. Uh, it was a little scary, a little exciting, but once we started, uh, it was a fun time. Uh, I have to say that once we got to Central Park, and you know, I, I'm, other people have said this, turned around and saw the line of people, how big it was, uh, was just somewhat overwhelming. I still sort of feel emotional about that. Um, interestingly enough, Bob, there is a, f I'm aware of at least two home films of that has parts of the 69 march, uh, one of which uh, I appear in two places <laughs> with uh, commentary uh, in terms of a thing, thing that was done at uh, the uh, Gay and Lesbian Community Center a couple of years ago. It was part of a, uh, a program called From, From Out of the Shadows into the Sunlight, in which Jerry Hughes gives commentary, uh, his friend, uh, this film was being shown, and I appeared twice. <laughs> and that has that has footage from uh, the 70 March? In oh, yes. Oh, it's a home movie. It was a uh, film. It has very, it's probably about 20 minutes long. And there's also another film from roughly the same period. I'm going to get that from you after we're done with this. OK. Um, so you, you, you walk up 6th Avenue, 
what were the reactions from the onlookers like? For the most part, the onlookers, once you got out of the village, were, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Who are these people? I mean, uh, what is this, uh, yeah, all these signs, uh, since for the most part, uh, if you will, uh, Mr. Average Public had no idea that there was this gay liberation or gay movement. I would suspect that a uh, you know, large number, if you ask them to define gay, would, other than happy and joyous, would, would never think of homosexual. Uh, some of the signs did say homosexual, and so some of the people, I think, really got the idea. I remember no hostility, no people, you know, sh they had more surprise or, you know, had no idea just what's going on. But um, ultimately, there were hundreds of, hundreds of people. When you end up in Central Park, you go into Sheep's Meadow. That's correct. And what was that scene like in Sheep's Meadow? Uh, like the BNs and happenings of the hippie days. You know, that was people lounging in groups of two or three, or dancing, or uh, somewhat smoking grass. I'm sure that there were enough people that were, had taken their acid ahead of time. Uh, but, uh, and probably the first march had no, was not political speeches. It was uh, more so, you know, tambourines and caftans and uh, I guess, don't remember particularly any drinking or in terms of alcohol. Alcohol was generally not prohibited, was prohibited in the park, other than for things like concerts. Or, uh, but music and just people lying on the grass. But there were no, uh, no speeches. It wasn't a political thing. It was out of the village, into the streets. I think most of the political was in the march, not on, not the end. Um, talk about the Gay Activist Alliance, your participation, what you, what you did, the firehouse. The Gay Activist Alliance, uh, after a few months, I was a member of the legal committee of the Gay Activist Alliance, ultimately becoming the chair of the legal committee. And I was also, because GAA was a formalistic organization, and I was a lawyer, about to be, about to be a lawyer, or at least trained as a lawyer, um, because I hadn't been admitted to the bar yet. Um, I was also the parliamentarian. And for GAA, that was an important job in terms of manipulation variety of things. Parliamentarian, they kept rules. It was an organization run by Robert's Rules of Order. And somehow or other, supposedly uh, legally trained, I was supposedly knew something about Robert's Rules of Order. Um, the GLF didn't like Robert Rules of Order. Oh, GLF was run by consensus. I served a month as the the moderator for GLF from mid-December 69 through mid-January of 69. GLF had a moderator whose job was essentially if three people put up their hand to speak, he would say, and you. <laughs> or let's not keep, let, let's quiet that, let's not keep it, you know, let's not get too, you know, too everyone to be, be calm. So, but rules were by consensus, which generally means whoever, la the person who can outlast everybody else. Um, we're talking about your legal work with 
gay activist alliance. Right. I was a member of the legal committee, ultimately uh, became chair. The previous chair was Carrie Bogan. Uh, Carrie Bogan was a lawyer who uh, ultimately became partners with another uh, lawyer who was a member of GAA, though not very active, called Bill Tom. Uh, sometime um, around 71 or so, uh, Bill Tom got the idea to uh, establish a legal organization similar to um, other legal organizations that were forming at the time, uh, such as the uh, NAACP Legal uh, Think Fund, the NAACP Legal and Educational Fund. Uh, Puerto Ricans has established uh, one called the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. He decided he would uh, form uh, a similar type of organization for gay and lesbians. Um, so he called uh, uh, Carrie Bogan and I, and we became, became the first three uh, people who founded the incorporators and the initial board. Um, as a legal defense organization, we had to get the approval of a variety of uh, organizations, including the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court of New York, they denied our application in that uh, decided that, one, these people didn't really need a legal organization. I mean, after all, uh, homosexuals were not a group like Puerto Ricans or blacks. Uh, they were had money, variety of things. And secondly, uh, perhaps it was scandalous that uh, an organ to try, homosexuals should try to have an organization uh, to do things when clearly they were, being a homosexual was against the law. Uh, Lambda sued the appellate division the judges of the court. The appellate division is the second level appellate court in New York. You have a Supreme Court that's a trial court, an appellate term that's an intermediate appellate, an appellate division that is the in the middle, and the Court of Appeals that is New York's highest court. Uh, we sued, Lambda did, uh, the court's system in order to be uh, legally uh, incorporated. Ultimately, we won that suit, and the suit called in Ray Tom. Uh, that permitted uh, us to be incorporated as a legal defense and education organization. Could you give the, the meaning of the acronym Lambda? Lambda is not an acronym. Lambda comes from, uh, well, GAA's explanation, which first used it, and Marty Robinson's boyfriend who designed the particular Lambda one. The Lambda was a Greek symbol denoting energy and activism. Uh, and then developed a whole mythos that's probably inaccurate to try to explain that about Spartans using it on their shields, and this, none of which has any historical preference. Um, Tom liked the letter, liked the way it looked. They uh, came up with a, a meaning, but it's uh, yeah, somewhat like the, the Nike swoosh. It was, it just looked good. So on a blue shirt with this sort of lambda, I mean, you know, how else are you going to, to you know, depict it? Uh, you know, it's like the old joke, a man walk, sees all these watches in a window, he walks in, he says, I'd like to get my watch repaired. The older Jewish gentleman says, we don't repair watches. He says, well, what do you do? He says, I'm a mole. 
He says, why do you have watches in the window? He says, what should I put? So it says, you, you, you have, you know, I come from an era in which you know, Jewish, though I you know, was Roman Catholic, you know, Jewish comedians, you know, you, if you told Jewish jokes in New York City, everyone would know what it meant. I probably don't, for those that don't do, do, do you know, I'm all the circumc circumcisions. And the man says, essentially, I do circumcisions. And so what should I put in the window to advertise my trade? I watched him. I, I watched one of those once with the oil. <laughs> OK. So we got a trade. You ask about Lambda. Yeah. So, this, so it's not an acronym. Yeah. I, I, right, right. Thank you for reminding me that, too. Um, the, so Lambda is established in 1973? I believe so. Okay. And, and you're, you're still part of Gay Activist Alliance. Lambda is? That's right. Uh, Lambda was uh, an organization that started in Bill Tom's living room, didn't get any sort of office space until, I think, 75, 76 when it got space with the, uh, ran out space with the New York, American Civil Liberties Union, not New York, American Civil Liberties Union, both in terms of their office somewhere in the 40s and ultimately on 42nd Street. At that time, Lambda hired its first uh, paid employee but I served uh, on Lambda's board of directors for 13 years, on its executive committee for 10 years, and five years as uh, vice president, general counsel, and a term as treasurer, and a term as secretary. <laughs> Can you talk about some legal wins, a couple of legal wins that you were most proud of? Uh, for Lambda, there were certainly the, the recent things, their, their involvement in marriage decision in terms of the Windsor's case. Uh, Lambda was participated with the person who uh, brought the case in terms of overturning the sodomy law, overturning uh, loitering for deviant sexual purposes. Uh, we had a variety of Corey Berg, who was a, a, an Annapolis graduate, moderate successes in terms of military decisions. Uh, one of our earliest decisions was a college case in, I think it was New Hampshire, that essentially the circuit court decided uh, there was a college group that wanted to sponsor dances and the college uh, refused the permission. It was important in terms of the circuit court deciding that dancing and holding dances was a form of expression that was protected by the First Amendment. Uh, Lambda was in all sorts of cases uh, from its early days. Uh, uh, some areas it was successful in, other areas we, we never just never got a hold of, like prisoners' rights were extremely difficult. Um, so uh, uh, to a large extent, most of the time, my time with Lambda, Lambda was still a relatively small organization. It was only until I, after I left, Todd started, Stoddard came in, executive director, it became more of a national organization in the midst of the AIDS crisis. The AIDS crisis was just beginning when, when I left uh, and now become a multi-office, uh, large, uh, some would say part of Gay Inc., uh, a subject that I have mixed feelings on. Talk about Gay Inc. and your mixed feelings. Well. My roots are with gay liberation. 
that is an organization whose part of whose aim was to shake up society, to look for alternatives, to do things differently, to not necessarily assimilate, uh, to um, innovate, not assimilate, whether it be in terms of family structures. I worked for a long time, worked with an organization that was working to increase gay rights. Nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't necessarily mean gay marriage does not necessarily mean everybody has to be married, or marriage is the only uh, type of relationship. So in terms that Lambda, in a way, has been pushing for all these things, not necessarily eliminating other things in terms of what has become to go as corporate, corporate gay of uh, the organization, the uh, infrastructure that is dealing with lobbying and uh, becoming just the homosexual equivalent of the straight world. to you by AT&T, T-Mobile, Tanqueray, all of this stuff. How do you feel about that? Well, I really have a problem. The problem in terms of that is that people who aren't affiliated have essentially been banned for the march. The first gay march that I marched in, I marched as someone who was not part of a group. Uh, now it's extremely difficult uh, in terms of eliminating that, eliminating anyone that's not with a corporation. Granted, uh, gay groups are permitted, but as we have shown, at, uh, as Gay News had an article, uh, priority in the parade or march has been is sold based upon the contributions of uh, the corporations that contribute. Who's responsible for that? It's Heritage of Pride that runs it. Uh, I, nothing wrong. I, I think it is great in some ways that T-Mobile can turn out 400 people who are T-Mobile employees who are part of their gay group. I have, or this organization, uh, and turning out hundreds of people. But when it comes to the enormous float, to, if it's the floats or individuals, I go with the individuals. Um, Gay Activist Alliance. What was, what was their role, if any, during the AIDS crisis? By the time AIDS really began, GAA was on the decline, or at least maybe even gone. GAA lasted, I don't know when the fire was at the firehouse, but it couldn't have been too much beyond 75. So that by the, if you count the beginning of the AIDS crisis, as early 80s, GA was, that portion of GA that I'm not really familiar with existed probably in name only, if at all. I had, I had heard, and I don't even remember who I heard this from, that it was some of the, um, some of the folks who originally had been in Gay Activist Alliance were central to forming ACT UP. Um, but that was probably true, forming ACT UP, but didn't go. Since Marty Robinson was very much involved, 
uh, was one of the founders of GAA and it was also very much involved with uh, ACT UP as Jim Miles, both of whom uh, died from complications of AIDS, as well as uh, Marty's uh, lover who designed the Lambda. They all died you know, from complications of AIDS. Um, Bruce Waller, Marty Manford. Um, so that during that, uh, that period, but GAA had been, for the most part, disappeared. Uh, GAA, if you want to draw some line, GAA maybe next to the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Since Bruce Waller, who was a former president of GAA, was the, became the executive director of the task force, and a number of people who were involved in GAA, both in New York and elsewhere, were the founding members of the task force. So there's more a direct line of GAA, task force, than in organizations such as ACT UP and GLAD, Vito Russo being heavily involved with GLAD. When asked the impossible, or not the impossible, in the last couple of days, we've seen the Senate confirmation hearings for Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. If he makes it in, my sense is that he's going to unless Susan Collins leans back the other way again and Murkowski. Do you, what, what is your sense of what may happen with LGBT rights? Or is that something that worries you? It's a concern. Well, I have no idea in terms of, uh, would require me to sort of see how they could overcome uh, existing precedent. Uh, I'm sure that there probably will not be advances, but in terms of you know what's established, whether it, whether it be ab abortion rights, gay marriage rights, uh, is a, I'm concerned that the matters will be restricted. Has has been all already been the case. Uh, a number of areas this administration has not been able to abolish things, but as with abortion rights, it has been either placing additional restrictions, placing some sort of uh, rules, regulations, et cetera, in terms of voting rights. So, so okay, so we'll will just challenge you know, the types of identification or, or in terms of if you are born in a border state, we'll first deny your, either revoke or deny your passport and say, oh, it's because there are irregularities amongst some midwives. You have to show twice the documentation it's not that we're against or restricting they we're just protecting. So I see more of that. Um, I agree, I, I see no reason as to why he wouldn't be confirmed. Um, all the prior, most of the prior uh, judicial appointees have been confirmed by those senators who maintain, oh, yes, I. They've nevertheless voted for all of them, right. as did John McCain. Right. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about or any questions I didn't ask, anything that you'd like to add at this point? Well, it's difficult for me in terms of, at times I've asked, what am I most proud of? And I am proud of, to use the slogan that Lambda used a few years ago, 
of doing my part in terms of moving history forward. Uh, I'm most proud of Labor Legal Defense. It has become the legal organization for gay and lesbians, and in terms of has played an initial part in terms of a whole variety of rights that have been uh, available to gay Americans. Uh, I could not have imagined uh, way back in 1960 or 61 uh, that things would have progressed so quickly and so much. Uh, though I never particularly felt you know, put upon or discriminated against or ostracized, as I said, guarded. Uh, but things changed from that to today. And I'm glad I played at least a little part of it. Yeah. It's a wrap. Great. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we just record like 60 seconds of silence?